I'm going to be talking about developing um, guidelines specific to initial evaluations for physical therapy. It's much more concrete. It's not quite so um, uh, touchy-feely or psychosocial. I'm a very uh, concrete person, so I hope you'll join me, join and uh, enjoy this part as well. My name is Sarah Feldman. I'm the physical therapist at the ALS Center at Drexel University College of Medicine in Philadelphia. And along with Peggy Allred, who's the physical therapist at the Senior Side Eye Medical Center, um, we've been working on developing this guideline over the past year. This started at um, a meeting with the Niels Group in Florida. Uh, Niels is the Northeast ALS Consortium, and we're physical therapists who are interested in not just the clinical care, but also doing research. And we were asking ourselves several questions. And the, we came up, the committee came up with some initial goals that we wanted to um, look at. First, we wanted to develop an interface where we could help um, other therapists as they're coming up. The therapists who meet at this group are, we have a lot of experience, and we've done, a, done this a lot, and yet we found when we would get together with each other, we'd be asking each other questions, like what do you do? What measurements do you use? What, are you, what outcome measures are you looking at? And yet we were, we're the people who do the clinics a lot and who have a lot of research. So we thought if we're asking each other these questions, a lot of other people out there must have these same questions. We also wanted to interface with other professional groups. We wanted to be the interface then between maybe with ALSA or MDA or with the American Physical Therapy or Canadian Physical Therapy Associations. We wanted to develop standards of care so that as we're treating the people that we're working with, uh, we know that what we're doing is going to help them. And we wanted to um, establish measures that we knew that we're asking the right questions. So when I was thinking about this course of action, it was interesting when uh, Melanie was speaking about, and she had that straight line, and then she had the squiggly line. That's a little bit about what happened with us, is we came up with some questions, and then we started to ask each other questions in our committee, and then we sent out a survey, and then we came back to the questions, and then instead of going in a straight path like you think it's going to, it goes back and forth. So we. I'm not going to go into this more, but just so you know, it's not quite the flow that um, you think it's going to be when you start out. Why did we choose initial assessment? Because that's what we did come up with as our primary goal, our first goal, I'm sorry. Really having the appro appropriate assessment done at the beginning is that's what you're basing your treatment plan, right, and your goals on. So you want your assessment to be accurate and appropriate. You're looking at the right things. We thought that people who didn't have as much experience would benefit from having these guidelines or having a template so that they're not wondering, are they doing the right things? Are they asking the right questions? And if we want to do research, then we all have to be asking the same questions. There's a big push for evidence-based practice. And if we want to be looking at, are we doing the right things? Are we asking the right questions? Then everyone has to be asking, if not the exact same questions, at least similar questions. So we did um, start to do a systematic review and look into some, what, what's out there for initial evaluations. And in the United States, the American Physical Therapy Association does have guidelines for looking at initial evaluations. And these are, this is an excellent starting point. But we found it that it was a very large framework. And we needed to narrow it down more to um, ALS MND and not just looking at the very large picture. Further review of the literature showed that there's really not a lot that's related to initial evaluation or the assessment. You can find things that are on treatment. You can find things that are done by other um, groups other than physical therapists, like neurologists. And you can often find things done on other patient populations, like SMA. But there really wasn't anything out there for physical therapy looking at ALS MND initial evaluations. So in the United States, there's um, 44 muscular dystrophy association clinics and 34 also clinics. And there are five that are both. So that's 73 different clinics. So we tried to find an email address to contact um, every therapist. You know, we're trying to get people together. 
and we were able to get 50, and we sent those 50 surveys out, and we got 27 responses. Now, I'm going to report on the, on the 27 responses, and I don't want you to think, wow, she just took 27 people in the country, and she's basing everything on that. But it's more of a, we're trying to get a sense of, are there things that we all are green on, and are there things that we're not? And I think you'll see that we really did get um, a, a good feel for that when we did this. We ask about the clinic structure. We ask about what te tests and measures people were using. And we ask about what they think we should be using. And we also ask a little bit about their level of experience in the clinic. More than half have been in physical therapy, practicing in physical therapy for more than 20 years. And more than half have been working with ALS MND for more than 10 years. So we felt like we were getting a good sample of uh, people. The criteria for asking our questions were first, is it within our scope of practice? Is it something that we should be asking as physical therapists? Does this question that we're asking, does it affect the person with ALS MND? Do we have an intervention? So once we know what we're asking, can we do something about that? And is it measurable? So these are very basic physical therapy. This isn't anything new right here. But just so you know what we were looking at, we looked at strength, range of motion, tone, pain, balance, fatigue, functioning, gait. The response is back, so the first three, strength, everyone said they do it and that physical therapists should do it and that you know, primarily the manual muscle testing is the way that um, it's done in the clinic and should be done. Range of motion, the same thing, 100% of people, range of motion absolutely should be done. And the same with gait. So all three of those came back very high. Um, gate, and we also asked, the, when I was asking about the different types of things, so everyone on this just said for a gate evaluation it should just be a visual, though some people did also add some extra um, responses. <coughs> the next one was pain, and there was a little bit higher percentage of people, still very high, 96% who said we should be asking pain, um, a little bit higher than what People say we are asking pain. And this one, the numeric, using a numerical rating came out a little bit higher, and that's the tool that we should be um, looking at. Uh, functional measurements, again, 93%. I, put the, I did put these in order as far as how high people scored them. Um, PTs should be asking about functional assessment. And then when it came to what we should be using, the majority of people say the LSFRS, but then it was also brought up that the therapists aren't always the ones asking that in the, in the clinic, and that we probably need a better tool for us as physical therapists. The next one was fatigue. A very high percentage also said we should be asking fatigues. And then uh, the fatigue severity scale came up as the highest that we should be using. Tone, the modified Ashworth scale, was the highest. Also looking at reflexes of Babinski were mentioned as well. It's just a general looking at what the tone is like. Balance, again, physical therapist looking at balance. This, was, this is one of the most interesting slides for me because if you think of it like as a scatter plot where when we looked at the strength where we were 27 for 27, when we asked the balance, uh, question, Everyone, there was a very high percentage that said we should be looking at balance in some way, and there was really, as far as I can tell, no agreement as to how we should be looking at that. This one had more other um, responses than any other. So this would be like a scatter plot, just as if you threw everything across there. So one would say this, and one would say that, and one would say that. So I think this is a really interesting piece, and so we'll talk more about it. Pulmonary function. So this was a little bit lower, and there's, and I think it's because in this, I know this is different in different countries, but in the, in the United States, it's not always the physical therapist who's doing the respiratory maneuvers. We have respiratory therapists who are separate who come in and do the respiratory maneuvers. So people were indicating that it should be done, but it doesn't necessarily have to be done by the physical therapist. 
And I don't have to describe any of those because they were described very well earlier. A few additional uh, responses were put in. Um, we didn't, we're not going to look into these right now, but I just want you to be aware that there, because we had the other piece, people could respond in. And so there was a lot about other functional mobility, um, way to communicate, quality of life came up often. And one that I'm interested in looking more at is the uh, PAD scale for assistive devices. So our recommendations then, what, we, what I would like people to take away for this is as physical therapists, we have some very strong um, responses to strength, range of motion, and gait. So these are things that everyone thinks, as physical therapists, this is what we should be asking in clinic. And as far as the strength right now, manual muscle testing is validated and is what we would recommend. Range of motion, again, general range of motion is validated and what we would recommend. And then, well, the goniometry, if somebody's having difficulty, so then you can pull in the goniometry piece if you're having trouble. And then gait, there's uh, just doing a visual gait eval right now is uh, considered adequate, though we think there should be some kind of clinical pathway that we can help people to, if they need to come, if they're not as familiar with uh, doing a gait evaluation, that they could help, that could help them to make their decisions. Uh, pain was, these were all a little bit uh, in the, still very high, but we should be asking them. Pain, we were talking about yes, no, with a numerical scale to follow up. Functional mobility, we want to keep using the ALS FRS because, again, that's a valid, reliable measurement tool. However, we feel like there should be other assessment tools that as therapists we can come up with. And then fatigue, yes, no, with the uh, fatigue severity scale. And the tone, the Ashworth scale. Additional recommendations, I put functional ability in again because of our discussion that we should come up with our own assessment tool. Um, balance, I really think is a big thing, and I think this is something that we can maybe make a difference in as physical therapists, is if we can come up with our, maybe our own tool for assessing um, balance in individuals with ALS MND, or could we validate another tool that's already out there? And I, there's been some look at that, like validating a balance tool in Parkinson's. So that might be something that we can do. And again, with the pulmonary function tests, I'm still recommending they're done, it's just not necessarily by a physical therapist. And just to point out why this is important in case, you know, it just seems like it's pretty um, basic. I've been attending these conferences and I listened to a lecture probably two or three years ago from a gentleman from Italy who talked about pain and doing, um, looking at pain in, in ALS. And up until that point, I didn't actually have it written on my evaluation form. I was able to put it on my evaluation form. And then just before this, I went back and did a survey of 100 visits prior to that and 100 visits after in about an 18 to 16 month period. And before that, I know I asked 24 of those 100 people if they had pain because I had 24 responses. But I don't know if I asked 76 of them. After that, I know that I asked 97. I don't know if I asked three because I had 97 answers written down. And the people who said yes went from either they doubled just because they, more people had pain or because I didn't capture them before. So that's a, you know, just to point out why that um, is good. And so again, further work that we need to do, though I think you, this is good for right now, is to develop assessment tools appropriate to ALS MND, to validate current assessment tools that we have specific to um, ALS MND. And these are just some, um, when we were looking for our resources, the NIH toolbox for the assessment of neurological behavior function is something that we are kind of thinking that something that we can then do with this information. And then, um, Patricia, Andrew, who's actually here, she was here, she left, okay, it's, um, she's also looking at different ways to do some of these um, outcome measures, which are going to be geared maybe a little bit more towards research, but also um, for our treatment. This is our current working group, and I'd like to thank all of them for the, uh, for the help.
And any questions? Thank you, Sarah. Questions? Up the back. On the balance, since you had so many different answers, did you break it down on the age or the year that those um, PTs graduated? Because sometimes there's like, um, you know, something going on in 1988 that everybody's taught, and then in 1996 they're taught something different, and that's just their natural way to turn? Uh, no, we didn't, but that's an, uh, that's an interesting way to, to look at it. Mm -hmm. We didn't ask them when they graduated, we just ha asked how many years. Yeah. But I, you know what, we, we could probably look back at that, yes, and, and match up when they graduated and what their answer was. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Down the front. I was interested in the balance question too. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering actually in MND how you manage balance problems. As a physiotherapist? Yes, I mean, as a physiotherapist. And, think, and, and the reason why I'm asking the question is because I'm thinking you haven't, I mean, you had a lot of different ways of assessing it. Mm -hmm. And just for somebody who doesn't know about how you manage balance, I mean, is, is there a clue coming from how you manage it um, about how you might assess it? Do you see what I mean? Um. I'm not sure I do because I come at it from the other way. I come okay. at it from how you assess it to how you would manage it. So if I did a balance assessment and I did the uh, balance assessment can't also live all by itself. You have to do the balance assessment and the strength assessment and the range of motion okay. assessment. So if I found you were having balance difficulties because you were having your heel cords were tight, then my management would be to have you stretch your heel cords. If okay. it was because of weakness, maybe an assistive device. So it depends on the um, the, out, the tool. Then de depends on the assessment. Can I say I hope you follow this up because, as I understand it, um, physical treatments, the research for actually whether it is helpful or not, is lacking, um, um, or people don't agree about it. Right. Um, and and. Certainly locally in Cambridge, I think sometimes it's more to do with the person than actually what, um, what they're doing. To do with the person? Um, the, person the personality of the, oh. of the therapist more okay. than what actually they're doing. I can't doing. help you with that. But, <laughs> but we, I mean, that is another, that's the next piece. So that we wanted to start with the initial evaluation and then of course moving on to treatment and and what we do once we have that information would be next and we are very interested and just like i said we get together then as therapists and anyone who's a physical therapist here i'm here peggy's here i saw tatiana we'd all like to get together and meet here we ask each other questions what are you doing what are, what practice are you using so one last question Hi, Dallas Forshu from San Francisco, California. Um, this balance issue, I think, is mm -hmm. fascinating. And you know, poor balance leads to falls, uh, which leads to injury. Um, Michelle Mendoza, a few years ago, published a pa paper that having very weak arms, even mm -hmm. if your legs are strong, can lead to a very, uh, a very much increased risk of falls and being off balance. So uh, I just thought that was so interesting. I'd share. I wonder if she's people. one of my. Pardon me. I have a whole list of. I'm wondering if she's on there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because I, when doing the, we're going to now as a group go back and look at each one of, um, not the strength, range of motion, and tone necessarily, but some of the other ones that had some things that we want to look further at the test and measure right. and do a really strong literature review uh, of those individually. I didn't want to give you all of that, but I did want to give you a long right. uh, resource, but I'll remember so that So this was name. a falls assessment, okay. and it was just an interesting thing that came out of that. Thank you. Please join with me in thanking Sarah.